Good afternoon and welcome to Webinar Wednesday. We're excited to have over 420 registered attendees for today's webinar, which is eligible for one credit from the ACI. Let's get started by giving one lucky attendee a Webinar Wednesday lunch bag for answering this trivia question. Today's sponsor, Technical Prospects, is headquartered in Wisconsin. What is the name of Wisconsin's oldest city? Answer now using the questions feature on your dashboard. While you're answering, I want to invite everyone to save the date for our fall MD Expo, which will be taking place at the Hilton Baltimore Inner Harbor from October 17th to 19th. We look forward to you joining us for three days of learning, networking, and the latest advances in medical technology, products, and services. More details can be found at mdexposhow.com slash Baltimore. Okay, and let's see who the winner of our webinar Wednesday lunch bag is. And it is, uh, where are we? Okay, it's Jess DiPolito. I hope I pronounced that correct, Jess. Uh, congratulations, the correct answer is, of course, Green Bay. Webinar Wednesday, we'd like to thank our sponsor, Technical Prospects. Technical Prospects works with medical imaging field service and purchasing professionals who require a partner with true Siemens expertise. They have more than 50,000 parts in inventory and a QA bar bay with 17 live systems for training and reliability testing of nine modalities. Their training and support team has over 75 years combined experience working in field service for Siemens. For more information, visit te technicalprospects.com. Our presenter today is uh, John DePasquale, Technical Trainer and Support Specialist at Technical Prospects. John, you may begin whenever you're ready. Thank you. Good afternoon, attendees. Let's get started here with a little bit about me as we get as we get into this here. I got my start in the in electronics while in the Air Force. My first four years was spent as an aircraft electrician, and my final 18 years was that as a biomedical equipment technician. So I've got a little bit of background similar to yours. There I was a technician, a manager. I actually taught the career field for eight years, and I ended my career as a regional manager. After my military service, I spent eight years in various imaging and biomedical capacities, including asset management for both in-house and third-party contract positions. Right around the year 2000, I left the industry and, and, and became a teacher in Connecticut and teaching high school mathematics in their vocational system. After seven years of that, I came back to the industry and I had my first OEM experience with Hull Logic. There, I served as their technical trainer on both analog and digital imaging systems and their support systems for their mammography lines. In, in 2013, I moved to Wisconsin and began my career with technical prospects later in that year. My background includes a master's degree in education, a dual, a dual bachelor's in electronics engineering and business administration, I have two associates, an instructor in biomedical equipment technologies. I've been an ICC CBET since 1994, and I was recognized by the Air Force as a master instructor. But enough about me. Let's get into talking about what we're going to cover today. We're going to talk about x-ray systems, subsystems, and then lastly, what you're all here for, troubleshooting. So let's jump right into our x-ray system subsystems. Here we're going to take a look at both the generators and also the imaging systems themselves. Starting with the generator systems, I've got a little diagram here of what the basics are all about. But when we look at an x-ray system, typically there are five basic systems that are in there that are incorporated in every x-ray machine. So starting with that, let's take a look at the required circuits. The first one is obviously our power circuit. This is what we call the line to transformer circuit. This can be anywhere from 230 volts AC to 480 volts AC. And older units were single phase, but our current systems today are predominantly three phase. Two other circuits are what we, what we in the industry call PHT and SHT. This stands for primary high tension and secondary high tension. This circuits here actually controls the length of the x-ray, but this is also where we develop the kilovoltage. Here we use the split secondary, we use phase shifting, and we regulate the output of our KV. 
in our older days and our older systems, we basically used a one to 500 ratio step up transformer that was subject to AC voltages, our incoming voltage, and also basically line frequency of either 50 or 60 hertz, depending where you are in the world. Somewhere in the late 70s, one of the manufacturers changed, changed everything. And currently we now use rectifier and frequency control, controlled inverter circuits on the primary side, but we still rectify the secondary. So we've looked at three of our five circuits. The last two circuits are the primary filament and the secondary filament. So this circuit here is what develops the MA. And here we have two types of ways of doing it. We can either use directly or indirectly heated cathodes, although I would say probably 99% of the tubes in the industry today are directly heated. This is also known as the negative side of the tube. And here we have two imp a very important thing called split regulation. When we look at regulation, filament preheat and boost is a separate form of regulation because that is done prior to the x-ray. MA, we regulate during the x-ray. We may use similar circuitry. However, the input to that circuitry is going to be determined by where in the system we are in terms of generating the x-ray. In our older days, our systems basically used a 200 to one step down transformer. And again, these were tied to the AC voltages coming in and also our line frequency. Currently, we use rectifier and frequency controlled inverter circuits and circuits on the primary side, again, with a rectified secondary. So as you can see, we have five required circuits. Now, there are some optional circuits here or specialty circuits as I call them. The first one we're gonna look at is the rotor circuit. And this is strictly there if you have a rotating anode on your x-ray tube. Some old dental systems do not have that and therefore you won't find a rotor circuit there. So that's why I call this a specialty circuit. Basically this uses a very common circuit known as a cap start motor circuit with the phase shift caused by the capacitor in there. Oh, the old Eli the Iceman from your days of basic electronics. Our rotating anode generally has two speeds. Low is less than 4,500 RPM, and high speed anodes are somewhere around 10,000 RPM or higher. We have our start circuit, which can be AC, back in the simple days with the cap start, or we can now use pulse DC when we use inverter circuits today. Braking circuits, however, that are associated with the rotor are strictly a DC circuit where we apply a high DC voltage across the x-ray tube using the stator windings. And as the commutators come in, this forms a temporary electromagnet, allowing our x-ray tube to come from the high-speed rotor almost down to a complete stop. A secondary specialty circuit is called a timer circuit. And this is strictly because we don't have a calibrated thumb to control an x-ray. My thumb cannot guarantee me a hundredth, a tenth, a one and a half second x-ray consistently. So electronically, we've created timer circuits to, to control the length of the x-ray. What we need to be aware of as field engineers is that on the radiographic side, which is high dose x-rays, there are two timers that will simultaneously start. The primary one is a five second maximum in the radiographic mode, and this is regulated by law. The secondary timer, which is known as the backup timer, which must start at the same time, typically energizes after about six seconds to terminate the x-ray. And when it does, it puts flashing signs all over your x-ray machine to let us know that it decided to work and that we have a problem. On the fluoroscopic side, which is low dose x-rays, we usually have a five minute timer and this is also resettable. Our last specialty circuit that we're gonna talk about is the interlock circuit. This monitors all conditions set by law or the operator. Now, I like to break this down into two separate things. One is what I call techniques and the other is what I call environmental. The techniques, determine are we going to be in either automatic mode or are we going to be in a manual mode. The environmental mode is what conditions are being set around, around the different environments, what signals are required, etc. 
regarding this the starting of the x-ray. Now, the whole purpose of the interlock is to prevent an exposure start unless all conditions are satisfied. Back in the day when I got started in this, we used something called relay logic. And what you would hear would be click, 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 click. And every generator had its own um, sound to it. And we, that's how we used to troubleshoot. With the advancement of technology, we went to logic gates. And so relay logic now became an AND gate which in which case then we needed all ones saying that something was good in order for us to get the one out for the logic to work. As technology further involved, now we, now we went into microprocessors. And so now today we're looking at the same thing. We monitor a lot more things. And basically, unless all of these environmental and technique concerns are addressed, we're not going to be able to have an x-ray. So moving on from here, let's take a look at some of our voltage waveforms and the types of generators that we have. If you notice here, you've got single phase, half wave and full wave generators. A half wave generator was typically found in old dental units where, we, where the x-ray tube was strictly the rectifier itself. When we use a full wave system, we add a diode into the secondary which then will invert the other pulse, giving us a full wave rectification, as you can see from the different waveforms. In three phase, we have six and 12 pulse. And the purpose of all this here is to lower the ripple because the, the, better, the better we control the ripple, the better quality of KV that we get. Our, our most common today is high frequency, and that's been around since the late 70s, early 80s. It is around in almost all systems today. And this basically uses a pulsating DC in order to create this particular, to create this. And as you can see, just from the ripple itself, it almost looks like a straight line because of the higher frequency. We're no longer being tied to the 50 or 60 hertz of our AC incoming power. The last one is typically found in portable systems, and that is a constant potential, a constant potential type system. All right, so let's take a look at some of the generators here, and you can kind of get an idea here of what we're talking about. Notice over here on the primary side, which is on the left-hand side of your picture, you see the KV control and MA control for the circuits. You see your split secondary as you move, move over further to the right with the MA meter in, 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 in the middle of this. You see the timer control on the primary side, and then you see the rectifier that goes through right before the x-ray tube, giving us the full, full wave rectification. Notice, though, also you see a plus and minus KV in the circuit there, because when we talk KV, we're talking potential across the tube. For example, if I'm making an 80 kV x-ray, you will note that the positive side will be at 40, the negative side will be at minus 40, however, the full potential across the tube is 80 kV. The MA control also ties into this, and you can see goes into the cathode side of the x-ray tube, which is where our filament is, and this is all gets tied together. Moving on from this one here. All right, if you look at the three-phase circuit, you still see the same basic thing, except now you have three, three different sides for KV control. You see your timer control in the primary. And then you also see the uh, three-phase six pulse where you see the, the delta on the primary and the dual Ys on the secondary. Each one of our transformers has its own rectifier with the MA in the middle. And again, we do the same factor across. However, again, we are still tied here to line frequency. Now, unfortunately, my computer jumped a second there and you got to see the next slide, which is our 12 pulse. The primary difference between six pulse and 12 pulse you'll find in the secondary side of the primary high tension. Where on the previous slide, we had, we had a delta YY configuration. Now in the secondary here, you see a Y and delta in the secondary. These two different transformers in the secondary create an additional 30 degree phase shift on the AC power. Hence, then when we rectify it, gives us a 12 pulse and a, and a smaller ripple and therefore a higher quality KV. Moving on from this one here, we now see high frequency generators. 
most high frequency generators here use some sort of configuration that is very similar to this. The biggest thing that you'll see is the big change on the primary side. Because in addition to the timer control that's going to the primary high tension on the left-hand side of your circuit, you see we take we have a diode there that's going to rectify our AC voltage coming in. We charge up a capacitor here that gets applied to our inverter, in which case we set the frequency, which is typically between 4 and 8K. That gets applied to the primary side of our primary high tension. The inverter is what gives us the pulsating DC. This pulsating DC is what's applied to our transformer, and then from there we go over to a typical full wave rectified secondary, and this gives us even a smaller ripple because of the fact that we're actually operating at such a high frequency, hence a higher quality X-ray coming out. When we look at imaging systems on the radiograph, on the on the on the on radiographic, but on the imaging side. We've got three different types of systems, and I put them all up at once so that you can kind of take a look and compare the different types of systems. Back in the day when I got started, yes, I'm an old war horse, are the film systems. And there you can see the different components that made up our film systems, the tube stands, the wall stands and table, film cassettes, processor, viewing, and film storage. In the way, and the way to full digital, they had a stopgap system that was called CR. And here in the CR, you can see that there's slight differences between the film system and the first level of digital, which was CR. And it was a cheap way for people to initially get into the digital world because now we had digital images where we can use packs and transmit as opposed to film. In our full digital world, again, you'll see bigger changes in things because now we're using detectors. We're no longer using cassettes. Um, we have different types of detectors. We have fixed detectors, which are built into the machines. And now more recently, we've added wireless circuits. The detectors have can be either direct exposure. They can have light exposure. So we go back to the days of film where we had direct exposing film and screen type. But what's happening is we have a technological advance, and this kind of gives you an overview of just kind of the differences between the three different types of imaging systems that are available on radiographic machines. So moving on from here, let's take a look at some radiographic imaging. Your picture here shows you typically that radiographic are over table two shots going some, going going through the patient to expose either the film or our detector. However, there is some key terminology here that we need to be aware of. One is called SID, and this is something that you guys calibrate, and this stands for source to image distance. The source being the x-ray tube, the image being the film or the detector or whatever your system uses. Two other terms that are part of the SID and that are inverse in nature is source to object an object to image, all right? The OID is what controls the magnification of the image. Now, magnification can be both a good thing and a bad thing, depending on what the technologist is trying to do. Another term that's very important to us as field engineers is half value layer, because this is how we determine the age of the x-ray tube, is it deteriorating over time, what's happening with the x-ray tube, and basically what we do is we measure how we take aluminum and we add aluminum into the beam and when we can control and when we can cut the output dosage in half, this is called the half value layer. What this is showing us is the change in inherent filtration, inherent meaning built in, and this is showing us what's going on inside our tube, the amount of damage that's happening at the atomic level inside our tube, and the change in dose that's occurring. Now, focal spots, we have actually, there are actually two. One is called the actual focal spot, and this is the area that physically gets bombarded by the electrons in the x-ray tube. However, the one that we use is called the effective. This is a geometric derived value of the central ray used in determining its size. This is what you see your x-ray tubes rated in. 
For example, if you see 8.6 or 1.2 millimeter x-ray tube, the 0.6 is the size of the small filament and the 1.2 is the size of the large filament. When you look at the fluoroscopic imaging systems, all right, this is strictly on the imaging side again. Again, I threw up all three of the different types of systems so that you can kind of see some of the difference that has gone on. If you'll notice, they all have spot film devices. However, the spot film device has changed over time in terms of its overall function. All right. The biggest thing back in the film and CR days is this was an electromechanical device, or maybe I should call it an electromechanical nightmare, especially when it came to the calibration. However, the new ones today, we've removed all that because we use electronic image capture as opposed to having to shuffle a film in and out. You'll also notice that in the early days, we used image intensifier tubes. That's now been replaced by detectors on our modern systems. We always have to sensor, I'll have a light sensor in there because this is part of the auto KV circuit because fluoroscopic images are live images. And when we, as we're going over the patient, what happens is we occur, occur different densities. The light output is going to change whether it's our tube or a detector. And so then the system will then automatically adjust to KV to give us a good quality image for the diagnostic purposes of this live exam. The pickup pick devices have changed over the years where we used to use camera tubes and in some of the uh, CR systems, you could see either or. The new ones today are strictly using CCD cameras. So this is something that again, technology has impacted. In all cases today though, all of our systems have got monitors that the images are viewed on. So moving on from here, let's take a look at some key facts about fluoroscopic imaging. I've kind of talked about some of them. And then you have a picture here showing you that notice that the x-ray tube is on the bottom and it's shooting up through the patient to the image intensifier and the whole sequence of the imaging chain, all right? With today's C-arms that are out there, the portable C-arms that rotate and stuff, you may have the x-ray tube on the top. Some x-ray systems today are actually designed for fluoro using an over table tube shooting down. That's all fine, but the imaging chain is still the same when it comes to that, all right? One of the things that we do use in fluoro is contrast media. Depending on whether what the, if they inject either a solution or air, will create a either positive or negative imaging chain on the on the patient to make something show up on the X-ray a little bit more clearly. All right, and and even on your hardwired systems that are have both rad and fluoro, the combination of the spot film tower down to the X-ray tube is also considered a C. It's more square, but is still considered a C as opposed to the nice smooth rotations of our portable X-ray of our portable fluoro systems today. So moving on, let's this let's get into what we're here for. Now that you've got some um, a nice idea of what the basics and stuff we're here for, let's get into troubleshooting today's X-ray systems. I'm going to give you some general info and some thoughts. We'll break down radiographic and fluoroscopic, and then we'll talk about some things in preventative maintenance. All right? Some general info and thoughts. To locate what's happened in our world. Well, we've had a discrete device evolution. Back in the day when I got started, we used to troubleshoot all the way down to the individual component. What I'm talking about there is that transistor or resistor, not, not like a huge X-ray tube. All right? Then we eventually evolved from there because they made the boards a little bit more complex. We went to single purpose PC boards where that board only have one function. Well, again, technology took over, our boards got bigger, and now we have multiple purpose printed circuit boards. And it's our job to get it down to that one board and be right the first time. So. How, how can we do this? Well, I'm gonna talk about four key checks that are very important to you. The first one we're gonna talk about is signal in, all right? Now, when I talk about signals, you can be talking to an oscilloscope or on a digital voltmeter. Both of these devices read voltage. 
However, if some cases you're looking at waveforms. However, in today's high sophisticated digital world, it'll just say, look for 18 volts or 24 volts, whatever it is, in which case we can use a meter. But in either case, it is still referring to a voltage type of signal. The second one is the signal out. Same kind of same kind of thing that I just got done talking about. The third thing here is power. Are, are all our power supplies proper? Very, very important. Now, especially on multiple purpose PC boards, you may have eight or seven or five different power supplies on that board. You got to verify them all. And the reason I say this is too many times I have seen where one circuit on a board will only use one of the power supplies. And I've watched people change out a board when in fact the reason the board didn't work or that function wasn't working is because the power supply had a problem. But because they said all the other circuits were working, they never checked all of the power supplies. It is incumbent and imperative upon yourselves that you guys do all these, all these four checks. The fourth, fourth one, is reference. Now notice I've broken this down to earth, circuit, and floating. All right. These are not the same. All right. Earth ground is protective. I know in our Siemens world, they call that PE ground. This is used for equal potential so that none of us get zapped when we're touching the machine. Because we have AC and DC circuits in there, you've got two different forms of reference. You need to look at your schematic to figure out where you're referencing to ensure that you are tied there in order to read the appropriate voltage. And lastly, floating, float, floating references, and again, that could be tied to the AC and DC. So these are just things that you need to be aware of when it comes to this. Some other things I'm gonna ask you to do, ask yourself this question. What was it told to do? Did it do it? I.e., a multifunction board. All my inputs are good. One of them's giving me a bad output. Did it do what it was told to do? The answer is no, all right? However, the other set of questions is, did we get the proper squiggly in and squiggly out? Remember I talked about voltage. That's what a squiggly is, it's voltage. Are the voltages in and out, are they proper, all right? However, when we do this and we're looking at the voltage, it's gotta be both size and shape, particularly when you're looking at voltage waveforms on an oscilloscope. They have to be size and shape. That is not an OR function. Some other things. X-ray machines are extremely logical. They're very logical, all right? They have to have things happen in a sequential order, and it's a building process. Our job is to figure out what's missing in that process and focus on that. I talked about the three different forms of regulation earlier, relay and and OR gates and microprocessors. The bigger thing here with microprocessors is it uses a serial. It's going around looking at all the different functions. The problem here is, and this is where our job got complicated, is because it's a microprocessor, it's got embedded programming. Those, those responses are allowed for in a particular time frame. If it doesn't respond, the machine comes out with an error, and now we have to figure out what's going on and why things aren't responding. So what used to be simple with relay logic has now become more complex because of time, time responses. These can be 10 milliseconds, could be 50 milliseconds. Again, these are the kinds of things that we need to know as part of our troubleshooting. Some other things that I have found in my years of experience here is understanding the limitations of your test equipment. For example here, let's look at the oscilloscope and digital multimeter that I've been talking about. We know they both read voltage because on our digital multimeters, we select the auto voltage, either AC or DC. But on the digital multimeter, you have a volts per division knob. So you're setting it, all right? When we connect these devices, they're connected in parallel to the circuit. That's important for us to realize because of the laws associated with parallel circuits, all right? Again, as I emphasized earlier, we have to use circuit reference, not ground, all right? The difference between the two is an oscilloscope shows you at a voltage at an instant in time, all right? And that's because we have a time for division um, knob on our oscilloscope. 
How do I know that? Because you can look at a signal and by changing that, you can condense it or expand it out and measure that voltage at an instant in time. On a digital multimeter though, it uses a sampling rate, which gives us the RMS voltage over time. Now, what you're typically gonna find is the digital multimeter has somewhere between a one and a one and a half second response time before it can give you an accurate reading. I bring this up to your attention because you'll find that there are switching power supplies in x-ray machines where typically you may only get a tenth, maybe three tenths of a second, in which case then the digital multimeter will give you an erroneous reading. You'll need to pull out your oscilloscope to read that particular voltage. So moving on, moving on from there, here, the other thing is that's important is understanding the primary function of the system. The generator, it gives us KV and MA and controls the length of the exposure. That's all it does, all right? Plus monitoring the conditions. Control panel is where the operator sets the technique, either organ programming or manual, all right? They also set the environment. Bucky in, bucky out. Are we shooting the table? Are we shooting the wall stand? These are the things that the system is looking for. Okay, now when we look at the table, here we set patient height, all right? They may, have, they may have motorized or floating adjustments. Some tables tilt, some don't. If they do tilt, they can be 90-90 or 90-15-20, which is in Trendelenburg position, which means that's the head lower than the foot. This is where we also house the bucky and grid assemblies, which help us take away the grid lines from our x-rays. Okay, moving on with this, we have the wall stand. It may or may not tilt, all right? It may or may not be motorized. There's a separate bucky and grid assembly in here with similar inputs to the generator as the table. When we look at the overhead stand, where it had, which has the tube and detector, you have 3D movements of X, Y, and Z, and then you have position movements of alpha and beta which is rotation around horizontal and rotation around vertical. There's also break and positioning detents that are part of our stand movements. The collimator has the light field that represents the x-ray field, all right? And that's important because this is something that you're going to be calibrating. They may be manual collimators or automatic ones. Automatic has a couple of associated terms, one called PBL and the other is ACSS. PBL stands for positive beam limitation. ACSS stands for automatic cassette size and sensing. What this does is it limits the size of the x-ray field to the actual size of detector or cassette. This is also part of a CAN system. Now, CAN systems is something that we borrowed from the automotive industry to ensure quick communication between various devices and, and to have our system respond automatically for us. Collimators typically have four blades and typically two motors, although there are exceptions to this. If you have an under table tube for fluoro, it may have an iris function, in which case now you're gonna have eight blades and four motors to try to simulate a circle that comes out more of an eight-sided stop sign. What does our x-ray tube do for us? It produces the x-rays and houses the rotor, just that simple. So those are some primary functions. Now we got the unwritten rule of troubleshooting. And before I give it to you, I want you all to take about 15 to 20 seconds, and I want you to think about what you think this is before I give you the answer. Okay, have you all got something in your mind? Well, this is what I was taught years and years ago, and today I still find this very true. If you don't know what you're looking for, stay out of the machine. Why? Why do I say that? Well, let me give you the reason. If you go into a machine and take a voltage reading and then go read the schematic, basically you're justifying what the machine will tell you. You know where that's going to take you? right down the rosy red path or the yellow brick road to nowhere. What do you wind up with? A headache, 
because you ain't going to accomplish a darn thing. It's more important that you have an idea of what you're looking for. So spend some time on those schematics. Take a look at it. Walk over to that test point and say, I'm looking for X amount of voltage. The answer is, do I have it, yes or no? If the answer is no, you better go find it. If the answer is yes, move on to the next step. Pretty simple when it comes to that. All right, so here's some suggestions about troubleshooting radiographic systems. Get as much information from the end user as possible. The biggest thing is, is don't be afraid to ask questions, especially if their message isn't clear cut. Do not assume, and this is one of the biggest things that I find about field engineers, and I was guilty of it in my early days as well. All right, for example, table won't go down. That's a pretty clear symptom. However, when an operator says, this image isn't, isn't clear, it's blurry, it has lines in it, show me. Don't be afraid to say that. Get an understanding what they're looking for. Let them give you their level of expertise because then you can apply it to the machine. All right, second thing we don't do as engineers, we don't allow the system help us what's, I help, what's causing the, the system, you know, what's causing our problem. For example, I give you three different ways of generating an x-ray, a tabletop, a table, and a photo timed. Now, what you need to figure out and what you should be knowing is, what is the difference between each of these? For example, if I do a tabletop x-ray, I don't need to worry about a Bucky and stuff. But when I do a table x-ray, now the Bucky is in play, cassette sensing is in play, and other, and other things. So now I'm looking for certain signals to be coming out of the table over to, over to the machine. All right? These are typically manual shots, which I'll talk about here in a little bit. However, a photo timed x-ray, now the machine's controlling the length of the x-ray. That brings in something else. It could be an ion chamber. It could be, uh, and depending on the manufacturer, some, some manufacturers use calculated automatic exposures rather than an ion chamber. Again, you need to understand the difference in terms of what's happening whenever you make a change to the environment of the x-ray. This here can help you narrow down areas of problem and stuff by knowing what was added or removed from the environmental change. All right, half split methodology. Guys, I'll own this one. This is the Johnism, all right? You'll need three items. You'll need an intensifying screen, a KV meter, and an MA mass meter, all right? In some cases today with the newer technology and stuff, the KV and mass meter are all built into one, which makes your life easy, all right? What I want you to do is I want you to generate a two or a three point technique, which is known as a manual x-ray. In other words, you're setting the KV, you're setting the time, minimum, all right? And you're gonna look at three things. The screen glow, that's important because now you know your tube's making x-rays. The KV, it needs to indicate what you got selected. And the mass or MA meter needs to indicate the same thing that you selected. If all are good, your problem's in the imaging system. It's not in the generator. The generator's done its job. How long does that take? You know what? Your setup is going to be longer than the entire time, and look at all the information you got from that. Now, if it's in the generator, find out what's missing, all right? Or if it's KV, are all the interlocks satisfied? Are you getting the key external signals, cassette present, bucky movement, et cetera? Are all items resetting after the previous exposure? Back in the older days, we had to pull out the cassette and put a new one in and slide that back in. That was a reset function so that we wouldn't double expose the film. Some, some older systems that have advanced to CR don't have that disabled. So that's a reset function. Error codes inf is the information available. Now, error codes is something that I want to spend about a couple of seconds on just to give you some key things. Back in the olden days, there was lists of x-ray error codes all over everywhere floating around. Everyone wanted copies of them. In today's day and age, you have an event log or error code log in your service mode. A lot of this stuff is now online. What manufacturers are doing is controlling the level of access through service keys. 
all right? So you need to be in the service mode to access the error codes, and typically there is a link inside on the error code. You click on that link, and now that pops up some of the things that you should be doing for troubleshooting. Again, the key factor there is, is your service access high enough? Just a little tip there for you. If the MA and master is open, home out your filaments. It's nothing more than the light bulb. Are they open? You may have a bad tube. Are you getting proper regulation? All right, during standby. In other words, are our filaments staying warm? Is the circuit operating correctly? Are we boosting to the appropriate level to create the space charge cloud? All right, during x-ray, are we backfilling it to keep the x-rays going and getting a proper amount of MA coming out? All this is tied to power supplies and are they working correctly? So these are things that we need to look for in terms of on the generator if we're having issues. Moving on from here, all right, if it's in the imaging system, which system do you have? All right, and again, I've provided some simple things for you to think about here when it comes to this. The biggest thing on film-based system is the processor. Are they doing the daily QC? And is the chemical strength the same? Is the, te is the temperature good? And we'll know that because the optical density is improper. How about light leaks in the dark room, cassette leaks? Okay, when we have a CR type of system, okay, now we're looking at what we call the S curve, all right? And typically this S curve is a value that's needed for the reader and it's a minimum value for that reader to work. If we're not getting the, the cassette plate exposed enough, you're not gonna get a good quality X-ray. Now, typically what we found over the years is that CR systems are, very, the S-curve is very similar to OD, however, it usually requires a higher level of radiation being given to the patient to get to that particular level. Some problems you may see is the clearing, the flash is deteriorating, you're getting a ghosted or double exposure. You may have a defective laser where it's not exciting in order for the photo tube to for the photo tube to read, or maybe even the photomultiplier tube is defective. All right. Computer, are we getting the information from the photomultiplier tube over? Is that is that is that link complete? And also we've got calibrations of the monitor, or maybe we have a bad display. Things to consider. When you get to the full digital, now we're looking at detector base. Some of the key things here, do you have the correct and current files? Do you have the latest mapping and calibration files? All right. Now, let me talk real quick about mapping and calibration. All right. Back in the olden days when we had first had detectors and stuff, we used to have to set the white and dark fields. And then we had the mapping, which was initially happening early on, especially with CCD cameras. When we went to detectors, which are live arrays, now we're remapping. On some older systems, we used to have we used to physically have to do the mapping. Today's day and age, it's happening automatically for us. So that when you do a recalibration of a detector and things of this nature, the software is reestablishing the white and dark fields and also remapping this on a regular basis to keep it most current so that we get the best quality image. Again, you need to look at the manufacturer because some still do it manually, some still do it automatically. It's up to you to know what you have on your system. Problems with detectors or power supplies. Our flash is deteriorated. We're not working. We're not clearing all of the all of the individual transistors inside the array to relevel them. We may have defective pixels. That's the remapping. We may have bad cables, fiber optic cables get crushed. All right, one quick way to check them is to shine a light on either end and make sure you can fully see it. If you can't, you may have a bad fiber optic cable. With the detectors, the new thing now is wireless. You may have a bad battery. You also got pairing issues, all right? Don't be afraid to kind of half step things, but keep, the, keep your customer involved in the process when you do this. All right, and again, data transfer and monitors are the same because it's in the digital world. When we get into previous and we get into floral, again, the half split methodology, the generator. A couple of key things to check on the generator though. All right, are we getting max R output? Because we are limiting the radiation to a max R in floral. Are we getting it? All right, that's gonna determine you know, how good the quality of our floral exam is. 
all right? The auto KV circuit, circuit, is it working? So as you're testing this, you put something in the beam of a different density from where you're starting out, all right? Make sure that works. The image intensifier, typically they don't go bad. Typically the biggest problem here is that the voltages to the acceleration plates are not correct, okay? You may need a high voltage probe for this, all right? Some have low voltage systems where you can monitor it there, all right? Don't be afraid to break the circuit. Put a mirror in there. Check the output of the green off of your II, all right? Same thing with a digital detector. Monitor the output when it comes to this. All right, our collimator, especially in fluoros, typically eight blades, all right? Creating an octagonal or circuit input to the II, all right? They, you know, are, are your, you have three different levels of magnification, all right? Basically what we do is we reduce the input to the II and then create that smaller input up at the output and that's how we get magnification. The problem with our collimator here typically is motors and calibration, all right, with an emphasis on the calibration. Some other things to consider are your photomultiplier tube or photodiode array, all right? These are typically positioned on the outside of the II and detector, and this is what's used to sense the amount of light coming out of the II or detector, all right? As we go over different body parts, this is what the output of the II or detector is going to change. Once this device senses that, it sends a signal to the generator to either increase or decrease the KV based on what it's seeing, all right? One of the biggest problems here is people fail to calibrate this properly. Pickup devices, video tubes and cameras, all right? Back in the old days, video tubes were simple. We'd grab the tube, go down to Radio Shack or our latest pharmacy, plug it in to see if it was good. CCD cameras are a little bit more difficult, all right? Okay, here you gotta make sure you have the correct defect map for computer processing. If pixels go out, you gotta replace the CCD camera because there's no, there's no remapping of a CCD camera, all right? Is the camera iris working correctly? This is what's gonna control the amount of light getting into our CCD camera. So you've got other factors to look at here and it's a process of elimination in doing this. The mirror optics, this, this directs the op output to where we want it to go, all right? On cert certain, some systems no longer use this, other systems have still got it, all right? Does the mirror move in or out? All right, are we getting out light out of the out of the mirror? Again, these are things that you need to be aware of as we go through. The electromechanical devices of the C-arm, this was a nightmare, all right? I'm pulling them both up so you can quickly see it, all right? Basically what happened was is we loaded a film in the background and then whenever the radiologist saw something, he had to record it in order to say, this is why I'm treating the patient. Notice in our next and our second line down there, you see all the different calibrate calibrational positions depending on the sophistication of your system. This is the electromechanical nightmare because basically what happens is the doctor is going over the patient, he sees something, and how simple it was for the doctor is he just rotated a handle in some cases. Once that happened, we stopped the fluoro image, the film came into the beam, the tube went into a radiographic mode, we shot an x-ray that we photo timed, and at the completion of the x-ray, the system shut down, the film went back, and now it went back into the fluoro mode. So I only had one chance to get a perfect x-ray. That's why we used photo timing. So now I had to ensure that all my photo timing was properly calibrated and stuff, because I only got one shot to do this. All right, now, because fluoro is a motion thing, all right, the other thing that happened is, is we had to break the C-arm during the radiographic exposure because if I got movement, I got a blurry image. That's not good either. So you can imagine here, back in the days of relay logic, et cetera, this electromechanical nightmare that we had to deal with, all right? New ones today, hey, Look how simple it is. We're going along, the doctor sees something, he pushes a button called image capture. 
no motion, no film, no cassette, no nothing, just records the image. Similar to your cell phone camera, your other little digital cameras that we use, very similar when it comes to that. The beauty of this is lower dose to the patient because remember in the old days, we went from low dose fluoro to a high dose radi radiographic x-ray back to low dose fluoro to continue the exam. Here, we just record the image that we're seeing, all right? That's the difference between the old stuff and the new. All it is is technological advancements. The functions are still the same. So moving on from there, now we have to worry about computers, all right? Fiber optic cables, keyboards, mouse, power supplies inside the computer, hard disk drives, are they damaged? Do they have corrupt files? Because we all know Windows never reads files, right? Do we have the proper maps and calibration files? Video cards. Are they, are they working properly? Is the image even getting into the computer? All right, monitors. We've got to calibrate the monitors now. All right, we have something called SMPTE patterns, which is with that we borrowed from the motion picture industry. We've got VGA and HDMI inputs. All right, that again helps determine clarity and quality. You've got two different types of monitors, color and monochrome. However, I'm going to caution you on one thing. If you get a color monitor and the and the people only want a black and white image, you need to go into the menu and set it for black and white. The other thing to worry about here, power supplies and proper pixelization. What do I mean? Is there's differences between tech, you know, the tech monitor and the doctor's monitor. All right. This is really true in the area of mammography. So some suggested preventative items here for you guys as we get near the end of the presentation. Number one, and I would strongly advise this, cloning of your hard drives, all right? I don't care if you use a Norton Ghost, Clonezilla, or if your manufacturer has a specific program. I know Siemens recommends Cobra, all right? For example, what do I, when do I want you to clone these hard drives? Once the machine is initially done, all right? If there's any changes to programming, if there's a software upgrade, and at the end of the annual PM that you do, so that if something happens to your hard drive, you can quickly get yourself back up to speed. All right, backups. All right, this is your data backup. At the conclusion of the PMI, update it. All right, some things you need to be talking about. Your generator calibration. How about your system? The 3D top, the floor stand, the table, the collimator, the wall stand. What about your computer information? That's where all your organ programming is that the, that the people are using. You need to back up and have all these things on backup. Why? So that you can restore information. Now, when you're performing service, here's a great, here's a great tip for you, all right? When you get there, do a backup before you begin. Do the work. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten a phone call in technical support where the guy screwed up his work and my first question to him was, did you do a backup before you started? No. Do you have a backup? No. You're screwed. All right? The worst that can happen if you mess up your work is you go back and you restore the system the way it was before you started your work and then go back and redo it. Strongly recommend you do a backup beforehand before you begin your work. Do the work, and then when you're done, back it up because now you've got new stuff to back up and everything, and leave it on site. All right. For those of you servicing multiple sites, all right, share the information between all engineers responsible. Do not, and I repeat, do not rely solely on the internet for access. I don't care if you use portable hard drives, flash drives, CDs. Find a way to share information so that the guy coming behind you has access to it. All right? And with that, my presentation is over. I hope you picked up something out of this that will that you'll find useful as you go through. That's great. Thank you so much, John. There's a lot of information there. <laughs> you, you did give us a lot of information today. So what key items should our attendees take away from your presentation today? Well, actually, there's three things that I feel would be very important. One is on the area of preventive maintenance, the annual cloning of the hard drive. 
all right? That is so critical because hard drives fail. And this, this is a quick way to get you back up and running as quickly as possible, as opposed to having to purchase a brand new computer. So that's something for in-house people to be thinking about. The other thing is, is be very picky when you're performing the PM on the system so that it's working at its optimum. Second thing to, to look at is how to quickly determine if the issue is in the imaging or generating side of the x-ray system. That, that helps you eliminate a lot of components and get you start focusing in on your issue. The third thing here is make sure you understand exactly what the technologist is communicating to you. Never assume, ask questions. That's great. We've got time for about one more question. Is what, what would you recommend field engineers, engineers do when performing service on today's imaging systems? Okay, as I just stated here quickly here at near the end, before you begin, make a backup of all your calibration data, then do your work. All right, I can't, I cannot tell you how important that is. All right, the other thing is that I would suggest is I think field engineers would be surprised to find out just how often performing a calibration of a function will fix its issue. During my time on technical support, one of my standard questions is, when was it last calibrated? And if they aren't sure, I typically advise them to perform that first, and if it doesn't fix it, to call us back approximately 85 to 88 percent of the time we don't get a call back as that took care of the issue all right and again by having the backup if you mess it up you can always restore and go back that's great thanks we're coming up to our hour so um thank you john for a really great webinar and thank you again today to today's sponsor technical prospects one lucky attendee will win an Amazon gift card for completing the post-webinar survey, which will appear on your screen shortly. Now, you must complete the survey to obtain your certificate of attendance. For more information about our upcoming webinars, please visit our website, webinarwednesday.live. Thank you once again, everybody, for joining us, and uh, hope to see you next time, and enjoy the rest of your day.